Good morning. It is a joy to be back. I've been away um, in my home state. I was born in New Hampshire. Thankful that Jamie Cook was able to fill the pulpit. And I uh, must confess that I'm not able to speak Appalachian. <laughs> but you must forgive me if a little bit of my Northeastern upbringing slips back in and I stop talking about New Hampshire. My brother Jim took me up on the boat. And he looks at me. No. Sorry. The problem is every time I try to do New Hampshire, I slip into Maine dialect, and then it just gets bad. You know, Bert and I, yeah. So, okay, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And this morning, our third and final week of intro into the Gospel of John, um, we're going to cover an outline of the entire Gospel. So if you're going to miss the next three and a half years, it's good you're here now, because we're just going to cover the whole book, one message. Um, No, but there's a purpose in that. There's a purpose in that. We've seen John has a purpose in writing. Back at chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, now many other signs Jesus did in the presence of the disciples. But these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. So that's where we're going. John is trying to show us, convince us, uh, strengthen our conviction that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the Christ, the promised suffering servant, the atonement for sin, and he's the Son of God. And we looked and saw that that meant full deity. So he is very God of very God, and he is the Messiah. That's what he wants us to believe, with an end result that by believing that, we would have life in his name. Now, as a good writer, an author, his book moves, and there's structure within it, and so... As we work through the book, and sometimes you can be so busy looking at the trees, you don't see the forest. I want to now lay out and look at the whole forest. Look at how John does this, so that when we're in chapter 3, chapter 7, chapter 12, we got some idea where we are. Um, How does this fit into the grander theme and structure of the book? So this morning, we'll have a word of prayer in a moment, and then we will consider an outline of John's gospel. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would give me grace. If those here listening, Grace, that we might see um, see your purpose in your word, that we might see John's um, purpose and how he intends to bring us to faith, to strengthen our faith, that Jesus Christ is indeed Messiah, God, Savior, and that we may truly have our faith in him, and that by having faith in his name, we may have life. Bless our study now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you'll see my outline has five points, but I would commend to you a simple three-point outline. Uh, The purpose, again, being as you read through the Bible and your devotions, if you can have some sort of handhold outline so you can figure out where you are in the book, I think that's helpful. I think it's helpful to view Scripture less and less as a string of pearls. That would be something like, oh, that's a verse I like, and that's a great parable. and And it's a string of pearls, but it's unconnected. And see it more like literature, like what it is. This is gospel narrative. And you're going to see John has given some very clear markers structurally to help us figure out where we are and what he's doing and how it's moving. You, you do this when you reread a book or watch a movie for the second or third time, and you can begin to see how the director or the author is setting up themes, foreshadowing things, moving us along, setting up for emotional payoff. John is doing similar things. So if you want a simple three-point outline that you may be able to remember, I just looked at points two, three, and four. I'll give you the blanks. Jesus' public ministry, it's alliterated, so you can get this. Public ministry, three or four years, depending on whether or not the unnamed feast of the Jews in John 5, 1 is a Passover or not, is three or four years. Then, that's chapters 1 through 12. Then, The upper room discourse, one night when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, when he prepares his disciples for his departure, Jesus' private ministry, three or four hours. Then Jesus' passion, oh, that would be 13 to 17, and then 18 to, you could say 18 to 21, I put in a a, a prologue and an epilogue, Jesus' passion, three or four weeks. So just very simply, 1 to 12 is Jesus' passion public ministry. He's out and about publicly dealing with people three or four years. 13 to 17, Jesus' private ministry the night before the crucifixion, three or four hours. And then 18 to 21, Jesus' passion, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, 
three or four weeks. That's something you may be able to remember. And as you read through the book, you can position yourself. So that's a broad outline. Now I've added two additional points because John clearly has a prologue and an epilogue. So we're going to begin moving through this starting in chapter one. I want to read the first 18 verses. We're going to be in here for a couple weeks starting next Sunday, Lord willing. And so I just want to read in its entirety, the first 18 verses. No, we're not going to read the whole gospel. Wish we could, but we will read the epilogue. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. That is so rich. And in this prologue, here's your first blank. John, skillful writer, manages to introduce the major themes of the book. John manages to introduce the major themes in the book. Let me just point out some of them to you. Most of the major themes and terms in the book that get repeated use show up here. Um, we have the preexistence of the word in verses 1 and 2, which corresponds to Jesus' high priestly prayer. Now, Father, John 17, 5, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Jesus' prayer in the garden begins picking up this theme. We'll see that in probably two years, maybe three. <laughs> maybe four, Daniel? Okay. He, he doesn't know. We'll see. Um, the notion that in the word was life. In chapter 5, when Jesus is beginning to combat the scribes and the Pharisees, he says this in 526, as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And that the life in Christ is light, we see in verse 4, well, that shows up in 812. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the life the light of life, or the light that is life. That's going to take up a major theme in chapter 12. That the light is rejected by the darkness in 1.5. That shows up at the end of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, as well as other places. The, the, the struggle between light and darkness is all over John's gospel. But simply, John 3.19, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Light has come, yet the light is not quenched by the darkness. 
And, and that's part of the big narrative structure that John is going to lay out is, is the light is rejected by the darkness. There's a struggle between light and darkness, but the light will triumph. The light is not quenched. John 12, 35. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you a little while longer. Walk while you have light, lest the darkness overtake you. Christ not being received by his own. The, 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 the greatest point of success in John's gospel is not among Jews, but among Samaritans. He goes to the village of the Samaritan woman. And eventually they all believe and they all confess. And then John writes this, Jesus doesn't stay there. He, he could have, I suppose, and had a fruitful ministry, but John 444, Jesus himself had testified, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So he went back to Canaan of Galilee. The notion of being born of God and not of flesh that comes up in 113. Well, that, of course, dominates the discussion with Nicodemus. You must be born again or born from above, born by the Spirit. There's a spiritual birth that trumps natural birth. And the notion of seeing Christ's glory in 114, well, that dominates the book. Look, Just look at chapter 2 after the first miracle at Cana, verse 2.11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Or 12.41, he cites Isaiah Remember in the passage of Isaiah 6 where he sees the Lord high and lifted up and his robe filled the temple and the glory and the angels are covering their faces. And then John writes this amazing statement. You want to talk about establishing the deity of Christ, that, that exalted vision of the Lord in Isaiah, whole earth full of his glory, angels covering their mouths and faces, covering their feet, flying and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. John twelve forty one. Isaiah said these things because he saw his, that is Jesus' glory. Yeah, beholding glory, big theme in the book. Jesus as the only begotten or unique son. Well, that's right there in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He loved the world in this way. That he sent his unique, one of a kind, special son. That whoever believes in him might not perish but have life. That the truth is in Christ. In John 14... Jesus cries out, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except by the Father. And then in 118, no one is seeing God at any time except the one who comes from God's side. In Jesus speaking after multiplying the bread in John 6, he says, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. That's just a brief glance, but most of the major themes in the book show up in these first 18 verses. It is a rich passage. We'll probably go more slowly through the first 18 verses than any other passage in the gospel. It's just so rich. So after he introduces the major themes, one other thing to note, that the major story arc is also contained therein, outlines the general flow of the narrative. Look at verse 4 and 5. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's a conflict between light and darkness, and the light triumphs. Even more clearly, the flow of the narrative. Look at 11 through 13. This really, I think, summarizes the, the narrative portion, the first section of the book. He came to his own people, or his own you could translate it either way. And his own people did not receive him. So the, the, the word will come to Israel and the word who has become flesh will be rejected by and large by his own people. But there's a great alternative. There are some, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That, that's the major story arc. The word, the Christ, the Son of God will come to his own people and they will by and large reject him. But there will be a remnant. There will be some who see and believe and those who believe will have life. And that's who John wants us to be, some of that minority, some of those who see and believe. And that's, that's the prologue to the gospel. And then starting in 119, we begin Jesus' public ministry. And it starts with John the Baptist. 
And I want to break this section into two subsections. And you'll notice that Jesus' public and private ministry have the greatest breakdown. It's because, for two reasons. One, it's where we'll be spending most of our immediate time. It's also where I'm spending most of my time in preparation. The other reason is as we move to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that part of the story being so familiar, I mean, I could outline the subpoints, but I'm assuming you've got a grasp of some degree of how things go there, so I'll just move more quickly. So because we'll be immediately spending our time in that first chunk That's where I'm looking and reading and studying. And because of the familiarity of the passion, I've done less outlining there. So if you look at Jesus' public ministry, three or four years, I think you could break it into two sections. And I've labeled them the beginning of belief and the development of unbelief. The beginning of belief, point A, and point B, the development of unbelief. And so really, from 119 through chapter 4, it's as good as it's going to get in Jesus' public ministry. There's a few sour notes, but by and large, this is as good as it gets. This is as good as it gets. It centers around Cana of Galilee. I mentioned how John's, as a writer, gives us signals. We have what's an inclusio. Got it right there. Sometimes I'll say ellipsis, and Daniel will will correct me as a loving brother. But it's an inclusio. And we see that looking in chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Okay? So bear that in mind. Now jump over to chapter 4. Jump over to chapter 4, 46. Right there near the end of chapter 4. So he came again to Cana in Galilee. And lest we miss it, where he had made the water wine. That is the bookend. That's an inclusio. When an author picks back up from where he was. That signals off that this section from the wedding at Cana through here, to basically two to four, is a unit. It centers around Cana of Galilee. It's the events that happened before John the Baptist was arrested. And this is where we see the height of Jesus' success with those he came to. It centers around Cana of Galilee. And there's another theme in here, an emphasis on Jesus bringing something new, or Jesus completing, or Jesus fulfilling, which actually links back to the prologue. Back in the prologue, in verse chapter 1, verse 16, my ESV has a footnote, and I think the footnote is the better reading. I'll read it with the footnote in. Verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received a grace replacing a grace. It's the Greek preposition anti, as in like antipasta. And so it's not, I think, it's not the notion of, of grace upon grace, like just presence upon presence, stacking up wave upon wave, but rather there was a grace and another grace has come in its place. Look at verse 117, which I think makes that meaning clear. For the law was given through Moses. It was the grace of God that brought the law. God didn't need to reveal his holy law to Israel. Mount Sinai, as much as it's terrible, as much as the law is a heavy burden we cannot bear, is a grace, is a kindness. Paul calls it the oracles of God. And now, Jesus, the law was given through Moses. And there's a clear contrast. Grace and truth came through Jesus. So this notion of Jesus bringing something fuller, bigger, better, Jesus fulfilling, dominates this. It starts with the conflict. Well, it starts actually with the turning the the water into wine. What type of water was it? Water in ceremonial jars becomes wedding wine. Wedding wine is the typical expected fruit of the messianic kingdom when the, the hills will drip with wine. I think John makes that point of what type of water to highlight what he's about to do. And then moving from that, that imagery to clearer statements in the conflict in the temple, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And they think he's talking about the physical temple, Herod's temple. And he's not. He's talking about the truer, greater temple, which was his body. And then in the conflict with Nicodemus, what happens? Spiritual birth, rebirth, being born again. And Nicodemus is confused because Jesus is talking about something that transcends natural birth. Then with the woman at the well, what do they get onto a discussion of? As she tries to dodge Jesus, he tells her to call her husband. She says, I have no husband. He's like, yeah, you're right. You've had five. 
And then she says, well, speaking of husbands, what mountain should we worship on? It's a dodge. And Jesus says to her, truly, truly, I tell you, the hour is coming and now is. And those who worship God will worship in spirit and truth. A, a location of worship gets replaced by a heart of worship. There, where, where, where's the geopolitical center of the church? Where should we make a pilgrimage to? Nowhere. Because we can enter the Holy of Holies. Any place. We have that type of access. We're going to see in John's gospel, Jesus making trips to Jerusalem for the feasts. We need no such pilgrimage. Because Jesus has brought something better. You need a right heart to approach God. But it matters not from where you do it on this planet. That is a new thing. That is a greater thing. Anyway, so that theme of Jesus eclipsing, Jesus replacing, Jesus fulfilling, dominates this, the uh, area of Cana. Then, after the high point, let's just, I want to read the high point. This is, this is as good as it gets in John's gospel. Look at 4. Oh, 39. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Because remember, she goes back and says, I met a man who told me all things that I knew and had done. And many more believed because of his words. So notice this growth. First, there's her report, and some people are persuaded by her report. And then they hear Jesus and more believe. And they said to the woman, verse 42, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Sounds like everyone in this town came to faith in Jesus. This is as good as it gets for Jesus' public ministry. And it doesn't get better than this again. This is the high point of coming to faith. Yes, there will be people, but mostly what we're going to see from here moving on is, at best, confusion. You're going to see some people said he has a demon. Well, others said, does a demon open the eyes of the blind? At best, there's a mixture. This is as good as it gets in the gospel for public ministry. This is the high point of faith. Which brings us then to the development of unbelief. The development of unbelief. And here, the, the location shifts. I mentioned before that John's gospel helps explain how the opposition to Jesus arose. If you just read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, you, you, it may appear as though Jesus just hung out in the backwaters of Galilee, which we know is, is nothing special. Does anything good come out of Galilee? And then he has one week in Jerusalem, and then everyone tries to kill him. And you might be left saying, well, how did the conflict arise? How did the Jews in Jerusalem and the Sadducees and the priests get so upset over so long of a period about some backwater teacher. Well, John's gospel shows us, no, as a faithful Jew, Jesus went up year after year to the feasts. Three different feasts, Deuteronomy 18, three feasts, every well able bodied Jewish male, three times a year had to go up to the place that God would choose, Jerusalem, and keep the feasts. By the way, if you ever meet someone who's trying to keep the Jewish law, just ask them when the last time they went to Jerusalem is. Because it was literal. Jesus, we see, did it. And if they say, well, that'd be unreasonable, that'd be hard. Like, well, yeah, that's the law deal with it. And so even though the, the other, so it centers around Jerusalem and it centers around the feasts. Now a feast does show up first in, in the first section. It's not a strict delineation. We've got the first Passover mentioned in 213. Sabbaths get mentioned, but then look at five, five, one. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. This is the one that if, it's a, if this feast is a Passover, Jesus had a four-year ministry. If this feast is not a Passover, then he had a three-year ministry. Then look over at 6.4. Six, 6.4. Four. Six, four. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Okay? So this action is taking place around Jerusalem. Jesus is out feeding the 5,000 near Jerusalem. Then look at 7.2. Now, the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. Now, you know the Feast of Booths is intense, right? You go and you set up a tent and it's intense? Okay. I can't help that one. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm a dad. I can't help it. Um, the Feast of Booths. And then, at chapter 10, we even have an extra biblical feast. In the time between the two testaments, there had arisen a feast. We sometimes known as Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication, celebrating the... 
uh, victory of uh, the Jewish people over some of their adversaries. And in 1022, we see that feast. Let me jump there. 1022, we have, at the time of the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. Then 12.1 gives us the third or fourth Passover. And so the action centers in and around Jerusalem and in and around the feast system. That, that's, that's part of the backdrop. It centers around the feast of Jerusalem. And here the, the conflict begins, starting in chapter 5. In chapter 5, Jesus absolutely picks a fight with the Pharisees. No question about it. He is escalating things. When he says to them, my father is working till now, and I am working. And they understand that's a claim to deity. They don't miss it. And make no mistake, a claim to deity in the presence of the Pharisees, that they're going to have a problem with that. They're going to have a problem. When we get there, I'll show you that it's an absolute escalation, because Jesus could answer the charge another way, and he does in chapter 8. But just suffice to say that the conflict is met in 5. There are people trying to kill him in 5. There's nobody trying to kill him before that. And then the conflict develops. And we still see some people believing, but what dominates chapter 6 is the hard sayings that Jesus has about eating his flesh and drinking his blood drive many and many of the disciples away. We see the falling away of superficial weak faith. So that Jesus even turns to the 12 and says, what, do you want to go away as well? It's, It's not growing, it's diminishing. It's diminishing. Ultimately, turn to 11. It's the raising of Lazarus from the dead that really seals Jesus' fate. Up until there, up until Lazarus, the Jews, he's kind of like a target of opportunity. They'd like to kill him. They think he's blaspheming. But starting in 11, they they realize, we, we need to stop messing around and get this done. And it's the raising of Lazarus that seals his fate which again, of course, Jesus is intentional about. He stayed three days after he heard the news so that Lazarus would die, so that he could raise him from the dead, so that his disciples would see God's glory. Jesus is in control. But look at 1145. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Well, that's good. There's that remnant. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered in council and said, what shall we do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So there, there's your hinge point. In John's gospel, now they've got a plot and plan. Before, when they see him, as they have opportunity, they pick up stones, they try to kill him. Now there's a conspiracy going on. Chapter 12 gives us an epilogue to this first section. Remember I told you that the setup in the prologue is that he came to his own, and his own did not believe in him. Look at uh, 1216. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. So the public ministry is done. What Jesus needed to do publicly in John's gospel is over. It's done. And then we get this epilogue. Though he had done so many signs before him, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And then we pivot to Jesus one night with the disciples. So that's, that's the arc, the narrative arc flow of the first section. And I need to pick up because we have communion. Okay.
Here we go. Okay. Jesus' private ministry. Look at 13.1. I'll move quickly. What is Jesus doing in John's gospel? He doesn't actually narrate the institution of the Lord's Supper. Again, I think that's because John is aware of the other gospels. He knows that ground is well covered. What he does want to point out is this. Great summary verse for this section. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's your theme for this section. Jesus preparing the disciples for his departure. Jesus preparing them for what will be a very difficult night and three days. Jesus preparing the flock that is to be scattered when the shepherd is struck. You can look at this in three sections in the upper room, chapters 13 to 14. Jesus prepares the disciples for what is to come. Specifically, he speaks without metaphor clearly that he will depart and that he will send them the Spirit. They're going to lose something. They're going to lose Jesus' physical presence. And Jesus says it's to their benefit because they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And you think, well, how is that better? Well, first, I wouldn't want to privilege one member of the Trinity over another. But the most significant difference is this. Jesus on earth is localized. He can only be with one group of people. The Holy Spirit is in all believers. It is to our great benefit. The indwelling Holy Spirit is given as Jesus ascends. And he tells them he's going away, but he'll, he'll prepare a place for them. He, he encourages them to abide in him. Then look at the end of 14. We move. We leave the upper room. And now, starting in 15 to 16, it's on the way to the garden. Look at 31, 14, 31. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Let us go from here. And so they get up and they move. And so we're to understand chapter 15 and 16 is instruction on the move. Judas has already left. And so in chapter 15, he continues to prepare them. And we get the, the truth that Jesus is the vine in which his disciples must abide. The big emphasis is on you guys need to hold fast. You need to persevere. You need to not give up hope. You need to trust that I love you. You need to trust that the Father will care for you. I'm going away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going away, I'm going to send the Spirit to you, and you need to abide in me. That, that's what he's doing. It's, 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 it's final exam time. And Jesus is teaching, preparing his disciples. He's loving them to the end. I mean, that, that's why he's saying, great is thy faithfulness, and he will hold me fast. The shepherd, he's about to die a horrible death, and his concern is that he equip, strengthen his little ones, that they not stumble and fall. The heart of our God is marvelous, marvelous. And Jesus will send the Spirit in chapter 16. And then, having loved them to the full, now Jesus turns and prepares himself for what is to come. And chapter 17 is one long prayer. My Bible titles it the High Priestly Prayer. However you want to view it, it's magnificent. Quickly, the structure of the prayer is that Jesus prays for three different groups. He prepares for his passion. And again, this is instructive for us and, and builds upon what Jamie said last week. If the sinless Son of God needs to prepare for temptation and suffering by prayer, who do we think we are that we don't need to prepare even more? And he prays for himself in verses 1 to 5. Hungry, longing for the glory and fellowship he had with the Father. Then starting in 6 through 19, he prays specifically for the disciples. Again, he's, his concern is for them. He's been caring for them up till now, but he will be otherwise busy on the cross. And he asks his Father to look after them. And then he prays for us. Verse 20, oh, I love this. Just understand, Jesus is thinking of us. In the garden on the night before he died, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. We are those who believe in Jesus through the disciples' word, are we not? Amen? Our shepherd has us in mind, and churches up and down the street and all over the world. Not just us, but he has, he's not less than us. He prays for us. Oh, 
Then um, we move to Jesus' passion, three or four weeks, chapters 18 through 20, moving very quickly. We have the arrest and trials. It's just such stark irony, contrast. 1914, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! So they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Pilate's taunting them here. They've pressed his hand. They've said, Look, if you let this guy go, we're going to tell Caesar you let seditionists pretender kings go, and Caesar's not going to like that. So Pilate yields to them, but man, he doesn't like it, and so he's sticking it to them every chance he gets. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. They put Jesus on the cross. And we get, in later in chapter 19, the unforgettable statement. Look at 1930. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. And then we get to the resurrection. Chapter 21, we have the foot race to the tomb. And John wants us to know he beat Peter. (laughs) Some people are competitive, I guess. But more important, more important than winning the race, the first one we see who understands is John tells us, look at verse 10, 21. So Simon Peter went abroad hauling, oh no, sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter, 20 verse 10. It would help if I was in the right chapter. Um, no, verse 8 actually, sorry. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. And then Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Then he appears to the twelve, and he breathes on them and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. And then he appears to Thomas, and Thomas, he says, put your hands on my side. And he says, my Lord and my God. And then finally, the book ends with an epilogue. In 30 and 31 in chapter 20, he gives us his purpose in writing. We have Jesus appearing to them on the sea, calling them. He reinstates Peter after his betrayal, tells him to feed his sheep. And then in 25, he closes his book. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So that's, that's the flow of the book. That's the narrative. We're to see Jesus gather his disciples. We're to see faith culminate and rise and begin It's going to reach its high water mark in chapter 4. Then the conflict's going to start. Then the disciples are starting to fall away in chapter 6. Then people are trying to kill him. Then he raises Lazarus, and a plot ensues, and one of his own betrays him. And he's delivered over. He's crucified, buried. But the darkness did not triumph over the light, for he was raised And he is alive. And John would have us believe this. Let me just close by reading John's purpose in writing. These are the things to be looking for. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray and prepare for our time of communion. Lord God, we pray that you would give us eyes of faith that we might see and believe, that we might hear the testimony of your disciples and believe. I, I still tremble considering that my God, my Savior, thought of me hours before his torment. Oh, Lord God, answer his prayer, not for my sake, but for his. Let the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering. In Jesus' name, amen.